Please. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you very much for the invitation here. Um, in the invitation, it was written sort of strange statements of the relation between economic growth and hunger. I think getting out of hunger, that is economic growth. It's such an absolutely basic step of economic growth. So it's the first one. You are hungry, you don't have enough food, some things change and you get enough food. That is getting out of hunger. It's so important, so it's even in the Bible. I would advise everyone to go home. You can find it also corresponding in other holy books. But in the Bible it's Matthew 9.11. Our daily bread give us today. Now it says bread because it was written where wheat was domesticated and grown. It would have been differently had the Bible been written in the cassava eating community or in the maize producing community. But to produce enough of the staple food and get over that hunger, that is to me economic growth. So there's no way of getting out of hunger without having economic growth. Then you can have economic growth without all in a country getting out of hunger. You can have a non-exclusive economic growth. You can have it in one little part of the country. Uh, and, and, or you can have it in a systematic way. But you can't get out of hunger without having, having, having economic growth. So... Start talking about the economy, I can't resist showing this photo. Do you recognize where it is from? Can you spot when it was taken? It's, it's, it's to honor George W. Bush. I used to do that. Uh, people remember the lecture if I honor George W. Bush. He's there. Obviously, he's the host of the meeting because he's standing in the middle of the front row. Anyone knows? Which year? I can help you. 15th of November 2008. I think this photo will be in the history books in the future. It is a turning point in world history. This very date. And it's in Washington. And what sort of meeting was it? Well, it was the G20 meeting. Remember 2008? It was that year when, when, when Bush actually lost uh, his good economy, the decent economy he had before. Uh, sorry, I'm just going to start my... my um, he, had, he had witnessed this crash on Wall Street. Uh, an enormous economic downturn. And everyone shouted at him, you need to take government money. Government money, Bush said? And he looked at his pocket, it was empty. He had no government money. During the good years, he had lowered the taxes. So he entered the bad year with a debt. He actually had a hole in his pocket. He had a hole in his pocket. And what do you do when you have no money? You ask your friends. He asked his friends. His friends was called the Gang of Seven. So he phoned Merkel and she said, no, Opel is in problem. I don't have any money. He phoned Sarkozy, no, 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 Renault, he said. Eh? He phoned Brown and Brown, no, Northern Rock is in problem. His friends didn't have any money. It's a pretty difficult situation. You have no money, your friends have no money. What do you have to do? You have to find new friends. <laughs> because the old ones are useless. I love this social network research that, that shows the really the situation of a person is if they can mobilize a certain amount of money within short times. That means they have friends with resources. It's a very good thing. You can look across the world and understand how things work. So, so he thought, who shall I phone? Who shall I phone? So he phoned the Australian prime minister because he was not part of G7. He said, does Australia have any money? No, 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 he said. Forget about it. You have to phone China, you have to phone Brazil, you have to phone Saudi Arabia. No, Bush said, yes, you have to do it. And then he did this very, very brave thing. He phoned the socialist trade union leader in Brazil and said, <clears throat> President Lula da Silva, does Brazil have any money to lend me? Huh? And Lula said, yes, in fact, we have. We have been saving lately. Huh? 
Can you come to Washington and lend me that money? He said, yes, but then I want to sit in the board of the IMF, he said. Okay, anything, anything, just come with the money. So here they came for the meeting, and you can see Bush is very happy after the meeting. (laughs) He's very smiling, very happy. Eh? Obviously, the new friends were good. There were people out there, you know, who had money. And who were they? When they stand up, I talked with the people who are involved in the protocol for these photos. It's an enormous discussion who should stand where on a photo like this. That's why I think you can learn a lot of it. This is also a main message I have. You can't understand everything from statistics. There are certain things which you have to look at in another way. Whether it's a rural community in India, data is not everything. It's a lot of other things which you cannot understand as numbers. If you go to the highest political levels, that is, how do they stand on the photo? And who is it? Here it is, here it's Lula, the socialist. Can you take down the the light a little? In cinemas, they normally don't have light on the screen. eh? Take down the lights here. Can you see Lula standing there, eh, the socialist? And Bush is here. Here is the communist, Yin Tao from China. And here is the dictator monarch from Saudi Arabia, Abdullah. But it's very good. Can you see that? Bush is sort of leaning to Lula. (laughs) He must like Lula more than the other guy. He likes a socialist more than a communist, you know. And because he has been... He won his position through democratic elections, several democratic elections. Finally he won, you know. But it's not so very clever because these are the two guys who have the money. In the world today, it's the dictators who have the money. Eh? So, so he's leading. The, 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 and, they are standing, and it's very interesting. Here is Erdogan from Turkey. Here is Singh from India. You know. And here, can you see Sarkozy standing here? He's very worried. How come that France is between a Muslim and a Buddhist? He said. <laughs> he's not used to this, being treated like that. You see how much you can understand without statistics. It's enough to analyze this, you know, to analyze this picture. You can see that the world has changed, you know. The world has really changed, you know. And, and, and um, especially you can see that Strauss Kahn was still here, you know, from IMF. <laughs> I sort of cut him a little there, you know. Uh, and and uh, this was the world. Now, what is interesting with this is that Lula is standing there close to, to, to uh, Bush, and after this photo has been taken, uh, here, here you can see it, he's standing there. Norway has been giving aid to Brazil. In fact, Norway is an honorable country. They give most development aid in relation to their economy in the whole world. And most of it is good. They do very good things, especially in child health and other things. But it's a strange thing is that the biggest recipient of Norwegian aid is Brazil. And they get $0.15 billion per year. And at the same time, Brazil lends to the United States of America $30 billion US dollar per year. Now, statistic is also very interesting, isn't it? How come that Brazil can lend money to the United States, which is 200 times more than they get in aid from Norway? Why do anyone give aid to someone who lends money to the United States? Why does Lula lend money to the United States and Dilma now continue? Every year. This is every year fresh money, $30 billion. So, Lula said when he came back from this meeting, this was a very, very strange meeting, he said. The rich countries who used to lecture us about how to run a country, how to run an economy, they are broken now. And they need our money and our help. And we have to help them, otherwise we crash the world economy. But this means we can no longer blame the United States and UK for everything that's bad. We have to take responsibility ourselves for the world. We have a new world order. That's why I think this photo will be in the history book. This was the end of the Second World War and the UN that was created after that. The emergence of G20 was an enormous important thing. And and Brazil is indeed emerging very, very much as, as, as an independent and capable country. And they are diminishing the grotesque inequity they had before. You know, we used to have Brazil as the example of inequity. Really terrible. And it's still there. 
but it's being diminished. There is cash transfer. There is development in rural areas. Child mortality is coming down. They are really doing the right thing from the bad situation. It's not a paradise. It's not yet completed. It's a long way to go, but it's going in the right direction. Now, countries have to think about this new way, this new world. How should we think about it? The multinational companies from Brazil are now becoming very strong. Sweden has another, the Swedish government has another relation to Brazil when it comes to aid. Yes, two weeks ago, the Swedish government signed an agreement with Brazil to join hands in development aid to Africa. And they said the Brazil know a lot of things. They've gone through these processes more recently. They may advise us on how to give aid. I think that was quite clever. That was quite clever. It's a very interesting, interesting things which we see happening. Now, let's go into the data. Let me start with where we often end up in, in discussion about food. How many people are we? How many are there who is going to be fed? In the old time, the world population was not growing very fast. Many refer to Malthus. I even heard it when I came this morning and listened here about Malthus. Malthus said, if the population grows, there will not be food for everyone. So why didn't the population grow in the past? Yes, 200, 300 years ago and, and thousands of years back, it didn't grow very fast. Why? Imagine father and mother. This is modern Sweden unisex thinking. I'm quite advanced. I'm not heteronormative any longer. We took away the breast on one of these two. Huh? <laughs> So, 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 so the parents, let's call them the parents to be modern. Huh? So I won't be criticized. They are the parents. Huh? It's very delicate in this country, you know. You have to be very carefully. Huh? On average, they got six children. It's amazingly similar. If you go through historical records, you try to you go into the rainforest. On average, some get very many, some don't get any, and so on. But on average, why didn't the population grow? This should have tripled the population in 25 years. Why didn't that happen? Why haven't that happened in the rainforest? Why are there so few people in the rainforest? Because there's a very, very high child mortality rate. In fact, in fact, one, two, three. Four of these children died before growing up and becoming parents themselves. It's a lie to say that people live in ecological balance in rainforest with nature. They die in ecological balance. But indeed, they have an enormous knowledge about nature. Indeed they have. And their human rights have to be defended. But don't be sort of naive about how life conditions are. Matthias Klum never brings his children to work. It's too dangerous. He'd be, bring an anesthesiologist, an intensive care doctor instead. It's very dangerous to be in the, in the rainforest. Huh? And life in the world was very, very dangerous for families up to just recently. Then what was it that happened after industrialization or after a much longer development of agriculture in West Europe? Huh? It was that father and mother continued to get six children, but on average only two died. That caused the population growth and eventually spread to the rest of the world. That's why we are 7 billion today, from 1 billion to 7 billion. It's a decreased mortality. Now, let me show you this, the family mat, we call this. It's a very simple way of seeing things. Here, the number of children per woman, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2. Here, how many of these children who die before becoming parents themselves, not child mortality, dying until the age of 30, more or less. One death, two death, three death, four death. This was the world average 1800. It was down here. It was miserable in the world. Imagine having to bury four of your six children. What can be worse in life? What can be worse in life? This graphic now is to sh answer the question, has the world become a better place? Yes or no? Let me show you. This is what happened. 1900 and up to 1970. Much, much better. Instead of four children dying, only one was dying. But then Paul Ehrlich got very nervous. Oh, Paul Ehrlich says, the population is growing. The new Maltas came up and he was criticizing because he wanted the world population to go here. 
If the yes have gone here instead with four kids and two dying, the population wouldn't have grown. But it's like the world population took a safety turn here. They took a safety turn. And they wanted their kids to, to survive. And then they were there with five children per woman. And what has happened since I went to university? This has happened. Average number of children per woman today is 2.5. And 0.14 die. The answer of the question is, has the world become a better place? Yes. It's definite. It's an enormous improvement. Magnificent. Is the world a good place? No. You see, can you keep those two things in the head at the same time? That's the only thing I ask for you. It's an enormous improvement. We heard from India, it's not good, it's not acceptable. It's horrendous how people live still in this world. Huh? Because the average is such that some countries are still here. Congo and Afghanistan is here. Congo and Afghanistan is here. But still, the worst of countries today is like the world average when I went to university. That's quite fantastic. That is only the worst of countries. There is nothing down here. Nothing, nothing, nothing down here. They're all up there. So it has really, it has really gotten much better. And I can show you this, I can show you this in, in, in other ways. This is the number, total number of children in the world. When I was born, less than one billion, and then it increased and became two billions. Because there were more mothers giving birth, you know. When they survived more and more, they were two. How many are, is it going to be in the future? This is United Nations Population Division. Which one of them, these three, is it which is their projection? Do the United Nations demographers estimate that it will continue to increase to 4 billion children, 2,100? Will it be 3 billion? Or do they say that probably the number of children in the world have stopped growing? This is it. We have reached peak child. May increase a little, may even start to decrease. We don't know. But the fast growth of children in the world is over. Still increasing in some countries, but also decreasing in other countries. Just go to Germany. Just go to Belarus. Just go to Italy. And go to Asia. Large parts of Asia now. Even the upper quintile in South Asia. The number of children per woman is decreasing. Eh? So, this is, this is more or less over. So, let me show you what has happened here. If I show you with these moving graphics that you refer to this transition that has been so gradually, so it never hit media. In 1962, all these countries, each bubble is a country, the size is population, had six to seven children. Look, China, India. The color is where they are on the map. And these are mainly Europe, Japan, and United States. They had two to three children. They had 50 children dying per 1,000. The other had 200 or 300 dying per 1,000. Just today we got the new news of child mortality. It's continuing down from last year. It's continuing down. And what has happened in this world, you can see when I run these graphics. Here we go. The number of ch children dying is decreasing and at a certain level, different in different countries, family planning start and they go for smaller families. India is not following so fast, but it's going here. Indonesia is faster. Here comes Bangladesh. Bangladesh catch up with India. They catch up. It's absolutely amazing what they are doing. They are more densely populated. They are managing better. Pakistan is behind there. Here comes many African countries join in in this enormous improvement. Completely changed world. And you can see now why the number of children is not growing. Here we have Bosnia and Herzegovina. Here we have Taiwan. No one child policy. And they have 0.9 children per woman. Here is China with one child policy. And it's 1.6. <laughs> People overestimate the impact of communists. <laughs> In the bedroom, the political leaders and the religious leaders are not present. Today in the world, we have the same amount per children per woman in 
Muslim majority countries as we have a Christian majority countries. There is no difference. The only difference is that the Eastern religions are lower. Even if you go to countries like Bhutan, Nepal and Cambodia, you have three child families already. Whereas you can find Christian countries, Muslim countries which are higher. Then within countries you can find subgroups. But on the whole, religion and politics is not about this. It's about decisions in the families. Eh? Uh, which are still uneven in many countries. Women doesn't have the strong say, but women get more and more safer every year in the world through different mechanisms. Still up here, I told you, Afghanistan and Congo. The two big countries, take away the small countries, like Sweden and Zambia and Nepal and these sort of small things which are insignificant. Eh? Um, sorry for Zambia and Nepal, eh? <laughs> which are bigger than Sweden. But anyhow... Of major countries, those who have the highest child mortality have the fastest population growth. Did you hear that? The highest child mortality have the fastest population growth. Because out of five children, only one is dying. The whole idea which we've been hearing over and over again that if you save the life of poor children, you destroy the planet. It's wrong. It's not an ethical problem. It's an intellectual knowledge problem. This is just wrong. It's not like that. And when countries fall down, you will see how the, 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 they decrease very rapidly. If I take Ghana here, for instance, four children per woman. Ah, Africa is not so fast. Is it something culturally with Africans? They keep getting so many children. No. I didn't have that graphics here. But if I split Ghana into the 20% with highest e education and a better income, they are down here. They are down here with Brazil and Turkey. If I take the poorest 20% in Ghana, they are up here with Afghanistan. Imagine within one country, Ghana has, has a range of agroecology. Up in the north, where it's poorest, it's like Afghanistan. Around Accra, the, the rich rural areas, it's like Brazil already. This is within one. So you, these country averages are dangerous, but to understand the pattern of the world is right. And look at India. 2.6 children per woman. I trained in India in public health 1972. Here I studied in India. It was five and a half children per woman. What an enormous change in the country since then. Dramatic change. But that 2.6 is some more educated and better off who have one or 1.5 children per woman, lower than Sweden. And others remote rural areas where I think you still find five to six children per woman. It's a country average. We have to understand that diversity within the countries. But overall, it's going in the right way. And why is this so important uh, in my... Uh, because it's... Going back to photos, these are the most common families in the world. You go to Mexico, you have two child families. Here's a two-wheeler in Vietnam, a two child family in India, Bangladesh, a two child family. These are Muslims, Hindus, Buddhists, Catholics. This has happened. Then you have the poor, which are pretty desperate. And for many of them, it's rational still to have many children. Because the child mortality is so high and they can't even afford to have them to school. But they will help in agriculture. They will help in this. It's not that people are ignorant and stupid getting many children. So coming there and teaching them, thou shalt not have many children, that doesn't work. I like the phrase on population which says like this, take care of the people and population take care of itself. Take care of people. See that there is school for children, health for children, access to family plan. You will get two child families all over or less. You don't have to have active population policies. Eh? Many of them violate human rights in a very ugly way. You don't need that. Can we trust UN population figures? Many say, ah, they are unaccounted. They are these outcast people in India. There are these uh, minorities in China. Look here. 1951, the UN population division said that there were 2.5 billion in the world and they thought it would develop like this. 1958, they said, we were wrong. It will be like this. Why did they change? Because between here was the first census after 20 years of war in China. India had censuses already before that. And there were much more Chinese than even Mao Zedong had thought. So when the Chinese census got right, they got it like this. Next time, more censuses were done, they did this. 
68, they did this projection. And since 1978, they did uh, this projection. And now we know 2000, how many we were. Because this year we don't know. Because the censuses are done every 10th year. And as, as you heard, there is no identity number in India still. So India doesn't have a complete register. They have to rely on censuses, which are quite well done in, 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 in India. Quite well done. Eh? And this is the right number. Respect. <laughs> and then Swedish journalists keep stay, writing, Hans Rusling claims or Hans Rusling thinks. We know population. We know this, but it becomes so emotional about population. We know pretty well what is happening and what will happen with population. What will happen is not this. What will happen is that we have almost reached the new balance without deaths, and we will level off here at 10 billion. So why will we be still one, two, two, three billion more? Why can't we stop now? I hear many environmentalists who say, we are already too many, let's stop here. This is a dreadful statement which shouldn't be allowed to say. Because it's not allowed to deny the Holocaust. How can people be allowed to propose ecological holocausts? They say, we have to stop. There's no way you can stop where we are now. I'll show you why. I'll show you why. Look here. We have today in the world 2 billion children below 15. There's almost 2 billion between 15 and 30. This is your age. I see it's a very common age in the room. You're here. Then it's 30 to 45, 45 to 61 billion. This is us up there. Huh? 60 plus, you know. <laughs> we, we are up there. Why are those three missing? Are they missing because they have died? No. They were never born. Because when we were born, there were fewer children born in the world. There was just half as many born, almost. Because there were fewer mothers giving birth to children. When you come from a six-child family world and you go down to a two-child family world, you get an uneven population distribution. This is the most misunderstood aspect of world population. It was called demographic uh, uh, momentum. We call it fill up. Because this is what's going to happen to us. You know? Have anyone told you? I don't, I don't think of it. We are going to die. <laughs> the rest are going to grow older, and then you, you will be here. In 15 years, you will be up there. You will have got your kids, probably two. Most of you will get two kids. On average, you will get almost exactly two kids. Then, what happened with the others? Ha <laughs> ha, they are also going to die, and the rest grow up, and they get their kids. Eh? And now you are up here. You are about to retire. Eh? There you are. And you see what is waiting? Uh, waiting up there, you know. There you are. 2070 will be up there. And two kids. And you have 10 billions. How could we have avoided this? How could we have avoided this? Well, if we started to get much less children. And then they wouldn't get any pensions. Because no one could pay their pensions. That transition won't happen that fast. If you want to be less than 9 to 10 billion, the first thing is cut all subsidies to daycare centers in Sweden. <laughs> Take away the Swedish bond, be drug immediately. And then you will get fewer kids in Sweden as a start and as a symbol. We are not going to solve any environmental issues in this way because that government will fall. That government will fall. I've discussed with the environmental party in Sweden. They are not interested in this po policy. <laughs> Yeah, you laugh. But then you come out and say that others should do it. I hate when people think that other populations somewhere else should do something they are not ready to do themselves. Huh? So we will be 9 to 10, that's what we plan for. No way. But the dreadful poverty remaining in rural India, remaining in so many parts of Africa, where agricultural productivity is extremely low, uh, where people don't have access to school or health care, still get six children, of which one or two die. That has to stop as soon as possible. I'll show you more in details here. We are seven billion today. One billion live in Americas, one live in Europe, one live in Africa, and one, two, three, four live in Asia. That's the world today. Very simple, very clear. One, 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 four. We will get two billions more, 2050, and one will be in Africa, and one will be in Asia. Did you see? Africa's population will double in the next 40 years. 
So if you maintain this productivity, there's no forest any longer in Africa. There's no way without at least doubling the productivity on the land cultivated today. And you remain on the same poverty and hunger level. You have to triple the productivity per hectare, at least. Huh? So I split this into north and south, into east and west. And you can see what used to be called the western world, you know. It's undefined. And you don't know how much of Greece you should include here. I took, <laughs> took part of it there. I didn't take Turkey there. Huh? And you still call the rest the developing world. The head of UNICEF phoned me three weeks ago and said, stop criticizing us. We'll stop using the division into developed and developing world. Did you hear? UNICEF is going to stop it. It's an old colonial Tintin worldview makes people give money to Brazil. <laughs> you should collaborate with Brazil by all ways. Uh, Norway can have a great rainforest project, but it's not development, it's not poverty alleviation. Huh? And, 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 and I have a new name for the developing world. It's the world. <laughs> the other is the exception. And the West, the old West, have to integrate. That is, will be the painful. It's not whether the rest will catch up. That's on its way. The painful is to integrate and say, Sweden and Europe and North America are not successful because they developed fast. Is that they started first. That's the reason. The progress of economic growth, health improvement, social rights, human life was not faster. In fact, we only got democratic at 1921 here in Sweden. We got democratic vote. Uh, India was 19. With the independence. With the independence. So it's, it's, it's a little late. India got free abortion for women before Sweden. You know, there are many things which are not so different. And sometimes, you know, I said, perhaps it was good to delay democracy in Sweden. Otherwise, we would have become Bolsheviks. I claim that the, the moderate part of the former conservatives, they should take pride in that and say, we delayed democracy. That's what helped in Sweden. No, because we don't have that historical perspective. We keep telling other countries, do as we do now, wherever you are on development scale. Huh? So, this is when I do it regional. Look here now. I have here up to 15, to 30, 45, 60. It's me up here. I'm in Europe, and I'm 60 and above. Huh? It's a boring place, Europe, same amount of people in all age group, children starting to decrease. The Americas will add one doll here of seniors for Latin America. Africa, look, 400 million below the age of 15, and that's after child mortality. Child mortality is mainly the first month and the first year. We have 400 millions, 300, 200, 100, and people of my age in Africa doesn't even make it to 100 million doll. You can see what will happen. Mortality is high as a child. It's high when you are old. HIV was never that high. It's now going down. It was tragic, but it was never that high. It never stopped population growth. Huh? Asia has stopped the number of children. Because some countries like Pakistan still having more and more children. Others, Bangladesh is just at two. Others are decreasing. In India, the number of children didn't increase the last 10 years. From 2000 to 2010, the number of children have stopped. But unfortunately, it's the poor rural areas where you get more children. Where you desperately need the sort of reforms you were talking about. That's where you need the development. So it's a challenge situation. But, you know, the old will die, the rest grow up, and they will get their children. The old die, the rest grow up, and then they get their children. The old die, the rest grow up. And then they get the children. It's a little cruel to show this to young students, you know, how life is, you know. And, and, then, and then the old will die, the rest grow up, and then they get their children, you know. Here. Can you see? Africa is set with present fertility to increase the number of children. Asia will decrease. Schools are being closed as we talk in China. Schools are converted to gym to avoid that Chinese people get obese. And then they will be home for elderly people. 
Africa is increasing. Now, what is this increase due to? But the total number of children is not growing. The total number of people will stop at 10. This is the fill-up. All the black is just fill-up. It's un- inevitable. The gray here, if you, get, if you get a rapid increase of productivity in rural Africa, if you get the right social investments, if you get a good international trading situation, if the African governments write clever contracts with those who want to invest in their land, which someone in a derogative way called land grabs. Land grabs, that's United States of America. That's what I call a land grab. Uh, really uh, half a continent was grabbed uh, what's now happening here yeah they took it my ancestors went from Sweden Lindley, they looked doubtful here they grabbed North America from the people who owned the land then they developed anything if you write clever contract with, 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 with Asia in Africa good things can come out of it if you run stupid contract in the interest of few it will be very bad uh, now So you may get less here. On the other hand, why do they get so few children in Asia? Why do Taiwan and Hong Kong just get one child? Without any, anyone telling them. Well, I was lecturing at the investment conference in Hong Kong. And at the dinner, I sat next to the young banker who were leading one of the most successful new banks. And she was less than 40 years old. And we discussed, and at the dessert, I, I got courage, and I asked her, don't you think about family? I mean, you have been so successful professionally now. You are, you are around 35, don't you think? Yes, she said. I'm thinking about children every day. It's the idea of a husband I can't stand. <laughs> You see, gender equity, as I look at data, it is an achievement of its own. It doesn't come automatically with schooling. It doesn't come automatically with economic growth. It's a fight of its own. And it can sometimes be very, very slow. And it has not happened in modern Asia. So women choose. Many know about these selective uh, abortions against women. That's not the main thing for this. It's that... Educated women in Asia don't marry, marry very late, and then get very few children. Uh, so this is what we get, that some people will get older, that's minor, that's over-exaggerated. Of course, I hope to be this person here and be around and look at the data, you know. But that's exaggerated. Uh, it's an obsession of the richest countries. That won't make a shit. People will continue to die when they are old. Now... Uh, So that was people. What about money now? What about money? Let me show you the income distribution of the world. Because I showed you country bubbles which are so dangerous. So dangerous just to look at average. Because today almost in all countries of the world, we have very rich people. Some countries, many countries, we have very poor people. Some countries like Sweden, we don't have any very poor people at all. Even to the extent that we have chosen to call Economic inequity we call poverty, child poverty. Mm, it's okay to change the meaning of a world in the language. We used to call it ojämlikhet when I grew up, social inequity. Now we call it poverty because it's more better for agitation. But it confused people very much. Confused people what then absolute poverty, what should we call that? Destitution. We are deprived of a word in the Swedish language. Of course, I strongly dislike the inequity. In Sweden, and that is a social stigma, it has carried with it several social problems. But it's not a lack of food, it's not a lack of water, it's not a lack of electricity. Uh, this was the income distribution 1970. $1 a day, $10 a day, $100 a day. Look at how unequal the world was. It was even two humps. This was the OECD, what you could call the West. On top of it, the rich in Latin America. And this was the Soviet economy who tried to reach. They reached in space. They reached in, in, in arms. But they couldn't create the same social economic situation as in the West. There they failed. And then the rest of the world was here. Africa was quite flat at that time. This was East Asia, lot of poor people in China. This was South Asia, lot of people in India. When I was trained in, in Bangalore, we, we were shocked about the depth of poverty in the rural area eh, at that time. So many people were here. And then you can see as population grow, also our income change in the world. Eh? Here we go. Let 
That's where we are today, more or less. Huge parts of India have come across the poverty line. But still a huge amount of people is on this side. Even in China and very much in Africa. But then Africa has also got the way all the way here. So there's huge difference within countries. Now, statistically, it's absolutely clear beyond all doubt that the percentage of people in absolute poverty have fallen. Whereas the number of people is not such an impressive change. That is the shame in the world. You understand the difference between the percentage and the number. That's the main confusion when you discuss the neoliberals talk with the anti-globalization people and say, poverty has not decreased. Yes, poverty has decreased. They take the different numbers. Eh? So, so, and really, what I'm really angry of is when people say, the poorest just get poorer and poorer. That's wrong. The poorest people in this world cannot get any poorer because one step in that direction and they die. Because we have so many fellow human beings who still live on that cliff where one thing worst is death. Just starvation. And that's why it's sort of symbolic that there is a cut here where you can be as rich as you want over there. Huh? Or not as you want, as you manage by one way or the other, another. Uh, so this is more or less how the world looks. Now, how is then poverty? How to understand it? First, how do we measure this? The poverty measurement is based on three to five years intervals, a household survey done in different parts of the year with households, where you ask them, how much have you consumed during the last two to four weeks? You base income on consumption. And it's very difficult to interview very poor people. I realized when Lindley Shavona and I worked together in Malawi, and there was such a difference when you worked in the areas where you spoke the mother tongue fluently. If you have an interviewer who doesn't speak the mother tongue fluently, you can forget about asking about food and, and, and household economy. You can't do it in a lingua franca or anything like that. You have to do it in the mother tongue. That, that, that's so important. So you get very bad data here. How do you value if you have catched, you have been very lucky, you have managed to catch two ra rats a week? And, 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 and that improved the family diet. Would you report that? Or you have stolen from the rich neighbor. Do you report that? Theft is a very good thing to, 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 to solve life for many poor people. If they don't get caught. Huh? Because you get so desperate, so you have your rules, you have your value, but these are my kids, I will steal something. Huh? And... and uh, we know that line very bad. The poverty line have a big uncertainty. I don't say we shouldn't use it, but we have to be aware of the uncertainty and don't build too many arguments of poverty rate falling slower and faster in the country. It's also old. The data we have now, which was uploaded some month ago, is to 2008. What happened in the world after 2008? 9, 10, 11, 12. The last four years we know nothing. It's pathetic when I see people criticize an uh, aid project over the last three years in Africa and saying that the poverty rate has not fallen in that country and the last data is from before the aid project started. <laughs> it's painful sometimes to understand the statistics because the debate becomes so ridiculous. Huh? Child mortality we measure a little more often, but, but this is, this is more, more or less the problem with poverty. So how does it look? Well, to me... To me, the poverty line looks like this. I have the permission by these two young people in northern Tanzania and their grandpa to show this photo as it is without covering their eyes. That's important. You almost need to have permission when you show photos. They have the disease, the paralytic disease that I've been studying for many years together with African colleagues across Africa. And it's a collapse of their food system in northern Tanzania. You know, they don't even have clothes. Food. Clothes, cover for the head. Talk over huvud in Swedish. It's a very good word in the Swedish language. Talk over huvud. Eh? And then some possibility of getting your kids to school. That's poverty, how people perceive it. Eh? And, and, and this is how it looks like. Getting out of this, that means a better life. This is also to me poverty. It can look nice. This is very, very sad use of girls' and women's time. 
It's an extremely low productivity to have to walk long distances just to get the firewood. And you see how it is to grow old in this situation. Huh? And how it is not being able to go to school because you have to work fetching the water. Here I want the development. Here I want the economic growth. And now I'll show you the economic growth so you will see how it looks like. This here, that's economic growth. Ain't it nice? This woman is now taking home three to four times as much water just by having a wheelbarrow. And she tells me, you know, she tells me, I love the Industrial Revolution. I just love it. The question is just who benefits from the economic growth? Who is enjoying economic growth? The poor in rural India, they want economic growth, but they want an economic growth that impacts in their life. And the sad thing with the data you get from India, you have this nice economic growth of the whole country. You have it in the rural areas which are close to the cities. You even have it in the slum. But the remote rural areas, it's even getting worse. It's even sad. While most of India is getting better, it seems that some remote rural areas are even getting worse. Market economy won't solve this on its own. It has to be regulation. It has to be a strong civil society. Uh, this photo is Lindley took on, on a, a woman interviewed. I've added some information, but she and the other women in Africa has really told and explained me during in-depth interview, not done by me, done by, by my African colleagues, especially female colleagues speaking the mother tongue. She told me, I went to school. I can read and write. They can't cheat me. I can count. Huh? Thank you. Aid paid for the book. Government paid for the teacher. Huh? I have a healthy child here. Thanks for the mosquito net. That was good. Huh? Thank you, World Bank, for the credits that gave us the Todd Road. I can reach much further. I'm not locked into my rural community. That's very good, she said. And then she says, my rights is very important. I have to make my own decisions. I have to have the right on my land. You know? I have to have this on all levels. I have a good husband, but he is working in town, earning money to build a better house. So I'm alone, and therefore I have to have my rights. Huh? Microcredits are nice. Because they bought me this bicycle. But that's only part of the development. Eh? And then, you know, I want the market to sell this product. But more than everything, I want a job. I don't want to be a farmer or peasant. Development is about eradicating farmers. No, sorry, not eradicating. But diminishing the proportion of the people who live on agriculture. Get it down to 3% and you have a good country. Eh? But in that, you can't take that in one big leap. You have to put down the foot somewhere. And that means increasing productivity of peasants. I think that's a good word in the, in the English language. In Swedish, it's difficult to translate it. Småbönder in Swedish. More, uh, more or less småbönder. Huh? But, but, but otherwise, it's torpar in Swedish. And not that they didn't have the right to the land. No? Uh, and then, of course, she wants information. People say that technology is not good. Technology is causing problems. But look at the cell phone. Did it get any aid money? Did civil society bring it? No, it was the bloody capitalists who did it. <laughs> and we benefit from it so much, so much. Thank you for that, you know, and especially in rural Africa. And it's still nasty, those companies, because they overcharge for text message. And they like text message subsidize. You should have a campaign against mobile companies that overcharge for text messages. No one has gone into that detail. I want a civil society movement against overcharging text messages. We did a, a study in Uganda where people said, had I, if I can, aff uh, they say, if I have a lot to say, I text. If it's just a little, I voice. Because they know the price. Voicing is like signing an agreement, otherwise you text. Huh? And then she was also concerned about the environment. She has two dreams for the environment. Electricity and fertilizer. Because if I get the electricity, my daughter can play and I can read books inside night. I can mend the clothes of this. We can be a family. We can sit inside our home. Electricity, we want kerosene lamps are costly and they burn themselves on them. We want electricity. But we don't only want the solar. They offer us these little lamps with solar panels. We want so much electricity so we can have a mill. I don't have to stand and pound on this day. We want a mill. We want a sewing. Uh, we want development. We need a grid. Put us on the grid. Huh? And fertilizer will increase my productivity. 
It's for, productivity is about two things. One is per area, the other is per hour worked. And there's no way, you know, it, but it, well, let me say, it's different, different areas, different, different areas. Some areas it's a desperate need for fertilizer. Others you can have other clever ways of doing it. What I don't like is when it becomes religion. When it becomes someone who has a monetary interest, a financial interest, and said pesticide and fertilize it to everyone. Or if you are in the ecological church and you say pesticides and fertilize it to no one. It's a sin. This is quite ugly, both of them. Uh, let people have power and see what is needed in them. Uh, and and, and, and uh, it's different in different areas. I think I will have more or less to stop there because I'm exhausting. I have a little more. I can use that for the questions. Let me instead show you this as an end. This is about the big game of economic growth. It's a final. It's like an Olympic. Eh? I have United Kingdom, United States, Sweden, Japan, China, South Korea, Ethiopia, India, Brazil, and Tanzania. They are in the final. They start 1800. They are going to run to 1900, 2000, and beyond. And here is the economy. $400 per person, $4,000 per person, $40,000 per person. Yes, it's a logarithmic scale, because economy grows logarithmically. You don't see it first, because a poor country with fast economic growth, very little happens, because they start from such a low level. So how did this develop? Britain was so rich. They were so rich. Eh? And they got richer. United States catch it up. Sweden was just like Japan, a little better than Japan. Kids got into school in Sweden there. Eh? Japan. Sweden was leaving Japan. Can you see? Sweden is getting up, but Japan starts to follow. China, India, all the rest are dominated. They're really not progressing. Eh? And, and here they are getting up, and now comes the First World War. Eh? Sweden is still somewhere in between United Kingdom and Japan, and Japan is way ahead of China. Eh? And here we see how we, we move up, and Sweden catch up there 1948 with United Kingdom. And then Japan, after the Second World War, they come here very fast. Brazil thinks to, plans to do it, but falls into the inequity trap with dictatorship and stupid policies. And South Korea overtake them. And South Korea comes in and catch up just there. That's why I, when I bought my Hyundai i10, my last car. Before that I had a Toyota, and before that I had a Volvo. It's not so difficult. It's not so. I will then buy an uh, electric Chinese car if I live long enough, you know. And India is here. India is very successful. But the success is very unevenly distributed. But be happy for the software designers. They are extremely skillful. Their skill is a very good engine. They're a very good engine. Tax them. Tax them in the good way. You can't do with bureaucrats. You need civil servants. Transform your bureaucrats to civil servants and tax the corporate sector and get it out. Eh? This is what you need. Now I'll tell you when they catch up. Can you see? Somewhere here. 2048, July, 27th of July. It's my 100th birthday. It may happen in my lifetime. But we are so unprepared. It's an exception. It won't happen. Remember the first photo. Remember the first photo. It's so easy, you know, that you don't think this will happen. Look at Tanzania. Look at Ethiopia. It's very good. There's no way they can come up here if they don't have economic growth down here. And the countries who handle inequity, they won't make it. The ones who reach up here have equity, involve the entire population in the progress. Because they become workers, they become consumers, you can't make it. And now we have all the environmental challenge up here. And I would like, if I get some questions, to tell what I think about, about the environment. The climate change is really a horrendous threat, especially after this summer, when we now see the ice is melting. You know that the climate skeptics were, wrong, were right on one thing? They said the models are wrong, and they were wrong. Climate is changing faster. Not slower, faster. But what we see is this trend. And, and if India doesn't succeed, they will do like Brazil. It will go here. 
If they succeed with democracy in China, they'll come up here. Most probably most of them will succeed. And especially I like, I like the African countries down here having this growth ahead. But it doesn't include the entire population. But who thought that? Who thought that a country like Mozambique, which is so geographically unequal with soil and agroecology, so do you think everyone would stand up and march to prosperous lines like a Pol Pot brigade? It doesn't happen that way. On the other hand, if you get a grotesque oligarchic growth with foreign investments that benefit a few, it won't happen either. It's between Pol Pot and the oligarchs you have to progress your country. Then you can achieve something about it. I distributed this graph here, and you have Gapminder's webpage on that. We try to provo provide free statistics. It gives you half the understanding of the world from data. The other half you get from other sources. Thank you very much.